The Apostle Paul has just spoken to the Thessalonian Christians of the coming judgment of God upon the man of sin and his followers and of the eternal election and sure salvation of all believers. Now he offers a prayer to God that is also a benediction for Christians. In this prayer, uh, the Apostle Paul looks back to the acts of love that God has demonstrated toward us in the past and forward to the great hope that we have of continued grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. This hope encourages and establishes the Thessalonians in daily Christian living, and it does the same for us today as well. Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana. I'm glad that you're worshiping with us this day. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we look at this benediction of the Apostle Paul at the end of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we pray for understanding to be given to us by the Holy Spirit. We ask, O oh Lord, that the things that Paul prayed for those Thessalonian Christians long ago would also be given to us today by your grace. And so please encourage and establish us in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Hear the word of God. I am reading today from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen. This is God's holy and inspired and inerrant word. May he add his richest blessings to our reading and understanding of it today. Paul has already spoken to the Thessalonians of his obligation and duty to thank God always for them. We saw earlier that he thanked God for their faith. We saw just more recently that he thanked God for their belief in the truth. And so now he turns to God and asks a benediction of God upon the people of God. He prays this wonderful prayer that is a benediction. Now, who is this God to whom Paul prays? He begins, first of all, by doing something very unusual. He puts the name of the Lord Jesus Christ ahead of God the Father. And so he says, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, in mentioning this, he gives the full title of the Lord Jesus Christ. He mentions, first of all, that he is our Lord, and by that, the Apostle Paul is considering himself together with the Christians in Thessalonica, as well as with other believers throughout uh, the Roman world and throughout all of history. He is our Lord and Savior. The second term that he uses is Lord, and that word is kurios in the Greek language. It's the term that Paul always uses to translate the covenant name of God from the Old Testament, the name Jehovah. And so Paul always, in translating Old Testament passages into the Greek language when he preaches, uses this term Lord to describe the covenant name of God. And so what he is doing here is he is equating Jesus with the covenant God of the Old Testament. He is calling Jesus divine. He is doing that by the use of this name. Then, of course, he uses the name Jesus uh, to remind the readers and the hearers that Jesus Christ is truly man as well. And so he is fully and truly God, he is fully divine, and he is fully and truly man also. This name Jesus means Jehovah saves. It was given to him by God through the angel of the Lord who spoke first with Mary and then with Joseph as well. Uh, for example, in Matthew chapter 1, we read this, uh, speaking to Joseph about Mary, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, 
for he will save his people from their sins. And the angel of the Lord also says something quite similar to Mary in Luke. Now, what we see here is then that he is fully God, he is fully man, and he is also called, lastly, Christ. Christ is the Greek term that translates the Old Testament term Messiah, and both of these words mean the anointed one. Jesus Christ is the anointed one because he is anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure for the ministry that his Father committed to him. And so when we put all of these ideas together, what we see is that Paul addresses Jesus, uh, addresses this prayer to God, and he addresses Jesus as fully God, fully divine, uh, because of the use of the term Lord, as fully man, because of his human name, Jesus, and as the anointed one, the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer of sinners, the Christ. And so he is the perfect Savior, anointed by his Father uh, to fulfill all that God has sent him to do to redeem the elect from our sins. Paul goes on in addressing God from saying, Our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, our God and Father. And so notice here that Paul joins the Lord Jesus Christ together with God the Father. And he calls God not only the, the Father of the Lord Jesus, but also our Father as well. He calls Him our Father because in the Lord Jesus Christ, being united to Christ, God is our Father. He has adopted us into His family. This means that the liberal notion that was uh, invented a number of years ago, perhaps in the 19th century, that uh, Jesus uh, Christ was not divine until the church somehow or other in the third or fourth century came up with this notion and invented it altogether is false. Uh, the Apostle Paul, of course, believed in the full deity as well as the full humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what is taught in the Bible. And so these notions that there was an evolutionary development of this type of theology is completely untrue. Remember, uh, First and Second Thessalonians are among the very first letters written by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. And so these date from a very early period of time and they show a fully developed understanding of Jesus as being both God and man. Now, another reason that Paul may mention Jesus together with God the Father here is the way in which we all are to pray. A number of years ago, when I was living in Georgia, there was a knock on the door. I answered the door, and there was a young man standing there, a teenager who was selling something. I honestly don't remember what it was now. Uh, we talked for a few minutes, and I mentioned that I was a, a local pastor, and he uh, stopped his sales presentation and he said, oh, I, I need to ask you something. It's, it's something that has troubled me. How do you pray? The answer to that question is you pray to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so true Christian prayer is Trinitarian. All three persons of the Trinity are involved in prayer. And so because Jesus is the one through whom we address God as our Father and through whom we are adopted into the family of God so that He is our Father, therefore these two names are combined together by the Apostle Paul. And so the God to whom Paul is praying is the triune God of Holy Scripture. The Apostle Paul continues his prayer to God with the assurance that God will hear and will answer. He says, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation. Now, he knows that God is favorable toward us based on those past acts of love that we see demonstrated by the Lord. Now, what are those past acts of love that Paul is referring to here? Uh, 
Well, he is referring, of course, um, most of all, to the work done by the Lord Jesus Christ that ensures our salvation. It begins with the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ when He came and was born of the Virgin Mary. It continues with His entire act of a life of obedience toward His Father, obeying all the commands of the law of God on our behalf. It continues with His death upon the cross uh, by which He took our sins upon Himself and He received the outpoured wrath of His Father that is due us, that it should be against us, but it was done against Him as our substitute. Uh, he died in our place. He shed His blood uh, that provides a redemption for us. And then He rose again in victory on the third day. His atoning death on the cross is uh, done for the elect, and His resurrection assures our justification before Almighty God. And then His uh, being glorified following His resurrection uh, also assures our future glorification as well. And so all of these things were done by the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of and for the elect of God. And these acts of love also should include the things that Paul has just mentioned to the Thessalonians, uh, things that regard them and regard us as well. Uh, he's just mentioned in the previous verses uh, their election, our election by God the Father from before even the beginning of time, from the foundation of the world, our justification at the right point in our lives as we appropriate the justification won by Christ for us, and we are declared righteous in the sight of God through Christ. Our ongoing sanctification as daily we die unto sin and live unto righteousness. And our final glorification at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. And that glorification doesn't stop then, but continues with God and Christ and the Spirit throughout all eternity. And so all of these things are acts of love that Christ has done for us and that Paul has mentioned to the Thessalonian Christians that we experience as, as believers in Christ. Such past acts of love give us Christians everlasting consolation. Now that word for consolation that's found here might perhaps better be translated as encouragement. Because God's consolation, God's encouragement is everlasting or eternal, in the same term. It will outlast any and every affliction that believers face in this world of sin. It will outlast all of those things in this age, and it will outlast also the judgment that is to come. And it will endure throughout eternity, future as well. And so while we are in this world of sin, while we are uh, here, we encounter many difficulties, we encounter many trials and hardships and, and uh, persecution and all sorts of afflictions. And yet what a joy it is to know that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world, to know that our sins are forgiven not just in this life but throughout all eternity, to know that our true home is heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, and to know that the truths of the Word of God will give us an eternal encouragement in the midst of all of our worldly sorrow. Paul now turns to speak of the wellspring of future hope. And he writes, and good hope. So all these truths from the Word of God give us a steadfast hope in the midst of worldly sorrows. Based on the past faithfulness of God toward His people in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we've seen in these acts of love that I've mentioned, we can have a future hope of God's continual blessing and continued blessing toward His people forever. So these past acts of love uh, done for us by God through the Lord Jesus Christ are the basis on which we can have future confidence in God's continued love and favor. As He has done in the past, 
so he will continue to do in the future. He is God who does not change, he says, and therefore we are not destroyed. So he is the good hope uh, for us. Uh, it's not a hope so. When we talk about hope in the Bible, we're not saying hope so, like I hope it'll rain tomorrow or I hope it won't rain tomorrow. Uh, we don't really know. Uh, but rather, hope is a firm assurance of God's favor to His people in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we speak of this good hope, we have a steadfast, firm assurance of God's love, God's grace, and God's favor to us in and through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, all of this comes to us by grace. It's not based upon our works. It's not based upon our merit. It is based purely and entirely upon God's grace to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is grace? Grace is God's unearned favor, unearned uh, goodness toward us who are sinners, uh, giving us the exact opposite of what we deserve. We deserve God's wrath and curse in hell forever. But God, by His grace, gives His favor to us who do not deserve it, but deserve its exact opposite. And so everything we have and everything we are is based entirely upon the grace of Almighty God. Our encouragement and hope rest on Him and on Him alone and not upon our efforts, not upon our merit in any way whatsoever. If God has shown us His love in the past, and if He has given us great hope for love in the future, then therefore we can have confidence uh, to call on Him in the present. We can rely upon Him. We can rely upon Him to help us to live godly lives daily and to provide the help that we need when we need it. Paul now arrives at the actual substance of his prayer for the Thessalonians and for you and me. He writes, comfort your hearts. May God comfort your hearts by grace. He asks God to comfort our hearts. That word for comfort is the very same word that we saw in the previous verse that was translated consolation. And once again, it speaks of encouragement. It's the encouragement that we need. And so this is a prayer that God would indeed do what already has been mentioned that He does do. He encourages us, and so Paul prays that He would continue in the present day to encourage us as well by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would take these truths that Paul has mentioned and that He would drive these truths home to our hearts so that we might live by them daily that they would have a practical daily effect in godly living in our lives. And so he wants uh, God to bring these things home to our hearts, he writes. Now, the heart in Scripture is, is uh, a word that describes the whole of our inner being, our inner person. It's not just your emotions. Often when we talk about heart, uh, in our country and in our culture today, we speak about uh, emotional feelings. Now, that is included, but much more is included as well. And so in the, the biblical use of the term heart, we're talking about emotions, yes, but also thoughts. We're talking about actions or deeds. We're talking about the words that we speak. All of these things are part of the heart. And so what he's praying is that God would bring encouragement to every single thought that you think, to every single word that you speak, and to every single deed that you do. Uh, and he wants that done for the Thessalonians, but for us as well. He wants us to have an application of the truths of the Word of God brought about in our lives as it relates to each and every single issue that we face on a daily basis. Paul goes on and says, and establish you. Now, this is a term that we've encountered already. As a matter of fact, we find uh, encouragement and establishing uh, to be mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 2. Uh, it describes a buttress or a support 
uh, or a foundation for a building. Uh, it's the building of the foundation and the subfloor of a structure, literally, and metaphorically as it's used here, it means to shore up or to add support to their faith. And so Paul is praying that God would support the faith of his people, you and me, as well as, of course, the Thessalonians back then. Paul asked God to strengthen us in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we will become unwavering. Now, in the Thessalonians' case, they needed to be unwavering because they were facing uh, physical persecution for their Christian faith. And there are many of our brothers and sisters around the world today who face physical persecution. In our country, God has blessed us that we don't face physical persecution so much as ridicule and scorn. But we need to be unwavering in the face of whatever it happens to be. And so uh, this prayer of Paul for the Thessalonians that God would buttress them, that God would establish them, that God would hold them up, shore them up, is a prayer that we need ourselves today, that our faith would become unwavering no matter what trial or temptation or persecution or affliction or suffering we might face in this world of sin. How is this encouragement of our hearts and establishment in our lives worked out? How do we live these things out? Paul concludes by saying, in every good word and work. And so this encouraging and establishing is not just for one single area in our lives. It is very wide-ranging. This is a prayer that God would do this in every single good word and work in our lives. So that the words that we speak resemble the type of speaking of our Savior. That the acts that we do would resemble His obedience uh, to His Heavenly Father. Now we're not saved by these things, but these are effects of our salvation that have been brought about in our lives as the Holy Spirit works. And so we are being conformed to the image of Christ. We are saved by Christ. And now we are working out in our lives the effects of that salvation. And so we should be able to demonstrate it by the words that we speak and by the things that we do. Uh, Phillips, in his commentary, remarks in this way, Isn't it remarkable that in the midst of the great affairs of history and the mighty clash of heaven and hell about which Paul has been writing, he concludes by saying that what really matters is the way that we live before God, doing all kinds of good works and saying all kinds of godly words. And so the focus then is upon daily living. The focus is upon not changing the world by vast, great works of some kind, but by living faithfully before God every single day in the small things of life, not just the great things, but the small things especially. And so ask yourself this question, am I showing my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by what I say daily? Am I showing my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the things that I do on a daily basis? Now, if you are, praise God, He's the one who gets all the glory. And if you're not, uh, ask yourself the question, am I a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if you are not, then I urge you to turn from your sins and trust in Him today. There is no other way of salvation. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved than that name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... If you have never done so before, turn from your sins and trust in Christ today. And if you are a Christian, focus on all of your words and all of your deeds resembling Christ and doing as He is shown to do in Scripture, living by obedience to the Word of God. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you so much for these words of encouragement, these words that establish us in the Christian faith that Paul has prayed for the Thessalonian Christians that apply equally to us today. Father, my prayer is that all who are Christians who are listening 
to this or watching this message uh, might be encouraged and might be established in the faith and stand steadfast, that their words and their works would resemble those of Christ. And Father, for any who are watching or listening who are apart from Christ, may the Holy Spirit give them eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe the gospel even today. Bring them to the foot of the cross, I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for being with me this week, and I look forward to bringing the word of God again next time.